2004, I was living in New York City um, and basically was super unhappy. I, I, I had a shitty job, I was commuting an hour from New Jersey. I'd routinely fall asleep on my train on the way home, which was the last train out of the city because I had a shitty job and I would routinely work till eight or nine. Um, it, it was just not, it was not fun. And I, and I spent most of my time actually kind of wishing I was back in college. Um, the, the musical Avenue Q came out that year and there's a piece at the beginning, uh, I wish I could go back to college. And like I broke down and cried when I went to see that. It was, it was pretty ridiculous. Um, and then I saw a job posting from uh, a couple people I barely knew um, looking for web developers in, in, in Kansas. And before I knew it, I was moving to a state I never thought I would live in, which I promise is not as bad as you think it is. Um, <laughs> well, the state, state maybe. Um, Lawrence, though, the town that I live there is, is beautiful. This is, this is South Park, the town in the middle, the, the park in the middle of downtown in the spring. The red buds are just glorious. Um, we have not one, but three locally owned newspapers in the downtown area with cats. Yes, shop cats are the best. Uh, an amazing live music scene. This is uh, the Flaming Lips playing in a venue about the size of this room. Um, really great local food and beer. Um, an awesome college basketball team if you're into that sort of thing. Um, and the reason I moved there, an amazingly um, progressive and really unusual locally owned newspaper in 2004, uh, we had a team of about five developers working for this paper with about a 19,000 circulation. To, to put that in perspective, the New York Times digital team at that point was about 10 people. So it, it was really weird and unusual um, to be doing really cutting edge web development in, in the middle of Kansas at a newspaper. So a year later, we released Django. Uh, we took it out of the tools that we had been building at the newspaper and released it open source. Um, we actually, like, I, I went looking for our, our launch announcement blog and I realized we never actually ended up publishing it because while we were editing it, people found the website and started downloading it and using it. So this is, this is our first actual blog post saying, uh, yeah, there's a tutorial now, hi. Um, yeah, and it was great. Um, we didn't think a lot about the organization of the project when we released it, or, or we thought some about it, but mostly we took our cues from the Python community and Adrian and I appointed ourselves uh, benevolent dictators for life, a sort of tongue-in-cheek, you know, it's a weird sort of dictatorship when, you're, when your community can fork the kingdom and set themselves up as a dictatorship, so it's a weird sort of term in open source, but it's fairly common. A lot of projects have these sort of dictator-ish roles. And, and that seemed, you know, that seemed right. It seemed to be working. It seemed to be good. So let's cut forward about nine years and Adrian and I resigned as, as BDFLs. And since then, my involvement in open source and in Django has, has basically gone to nothing. Uh, my last commit to Django was maybe a year and a half ago and it was fixing a link in the readme. Um, I stepped down from my roles on the DSF, the Django Software Foundation. I barely write open source software. At this point, my involvement in the open source community is basically coming to events like this and thinking about how I used to be involved in open source. <laughs> so that's, that's the story. That's the arc of, of my involvement in, in open source today, to, to date. Um, and, and you know, many people know that story. What I haven't really spoken about or written about until recently is, is, is the why, is you know, why I went from considering open source to be an incredible important part of my, my life and, and my identity, and why you know, something that gave me so much um, has become something that I don't have um, the energy for anymore. And what it comes down to is there were, there were three things I just couldn't deal with, three problems I couldn't handle. Um, and, and I give up. And those problems are burnout, money, and toxic people. Um, this is a, probably a pretty good time to mention that the rest of this talk has some discussions of burnout and depression, um, harassment, and toxic people within our communities. Nothing specific, but I am going to talk about them and how, and, and how they affected me and others in the community. Also, um, 
<laughs> so, so look, uh, I'm used to giving like two types of talks. I'm used to giving a talk where I'm trying to teach something and, you know, it doesn't have to be like exciting or, or happy or fun, but like at the end I want you to, you know, walk out and like know something you didn't know before. Or, or I'm used to giving sort of the like uplifting, inspiring, you know, yeah, let's go do the thing, you know, type of talk. Um, so this is weird for me because all I have here are questions. I don't have answers and they're questions that, that, um, that really <laughs> bum me out and depress me. Um, <laughs> If you follow me on Twitter, you may have noticed in the, the last few weeks, in the, every evening I've been tweeting kind of bummed out stuff because what I've been doing is sitting down and working on this talk every evening and until I get too depressed to keep working on it and I set it aside and, and move on to other stuff. So, um, yeah, I don't know why y'all asked me to speak first. I hope I don't... Uh... <laughs> hey, it says feelings right on the marquee. You know what you're in for. All right. So, it's fairly obvious that, I, that I, what I'm describing here is burnout. Um, and I'm by no means the right person to really talk about burnout in general. Um, I can point to a couple of, uh, of people who have covered burnout in, in ways that I really, that really spoke to me. Um, Kathleen has given a talk a few times called Avoiding Burnout and Essentials of Open Source Care. Um, uh, there's a link to her video from PyCon, she's given it a few other times there. And then uh, Julie, who's actually here today, um, talks about it in her, in her, her talk she's given a number of times. Uh, it's dangerous to go alone. Um, the sort of second half of that talk, as I remember, is, is all about um, burnout and, 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 and handling it. Um, so definitely check them out. I, I did not take their advice, and I probably should have. I wish I had had these resources a few years ago. So f for me, um, the, the thing that helped me identify what I was, that what I was feeling was burnout was this sort of like burnout model um, uh, from a, a couple of psychologists. Uh, and Wikipedia has a surprisingly good summary uh, of it. Um, and I kind of want to talk through like what, what this felt like for me going, going through it. You, you know, like I said, it wasn't until fairly late that I really identified and named what, what I was feeling. Um, but in retrospect, sort of, my burnout maps very well to these sort of stages of burnout. Um, so it starts kind of with a compulsion to, to prove oneself. I mean, for me, I, I felt like, you know, we had, we had open sourced this thing and I wanted it to be really awesome and I needed to, you know, I needed to, to make this really great. And the more I lost interest, the harder I worked to try to like overcome it, you know. It, yeah, this isn't, you know, this isn't fun anymore, but if I just do it harder, it, it'll, I'll make it fun again. Um, working harder, um, neglecting needs. I stopped taking time off, really, or rather I would take time off from work so that I could work on open source, which was also kind of what I was working, and, you know, it wasn't really, you know, I stopped taking vacations. I, I remember in particular in, uh, in Florida with, with my wife and her family sitting on the beach and, and, and reviewing pull requests. Um, at a certain point, I started, I stopped identifying did I ever? I don't think I ever identified the problem as my own. I started identifying it as other people's problems. If only these, these idiots would stop submitting bad code that I would have to review. If only these, these jerks would stop asking for help. Like, it wasn't my fault that, that I couldn't, you know, muster the energy to work on this. It was, it was all these, these stupid people out there. And I started, you know, making it about, about other people's problems. At a certain point, you kind of have to... I had to change what my value system was to accommodate my increasing disconnect from the work that I was doing. And I somehow made it about, like, if I can just do this more and make it better, this will, like, help me get a, a, a higher paying job and then I'll have more money and then I can retire and not work anymore. It's a very weird, I, I can't even really summon why I thought that that was a good plan, but it seemed really good at the time. Um, you know, all through it, I, I didn't really, note that there was a slide, I just sort of felt like um, I was doing the only thing I could under the circumstances. So yeah, you start withdrawing, I, st I stopped participating as much, I would say that I would do something and then just not do it, I would, you know, be around in the community, but I didn't really acknowledge that I was stepping away. At a certain point, other people start to notice 
that you're different, and that's, you know, that's getting more and more difficult. And it was, it was around here, um, no longer seeing myself as valuable, feeling really just kind of like nothing mattered anymore, and finally, you know, entering what really can only be described as depression, that I finally sort of noticed what, where I was. Um, Luckily for me, I didn't reach the, what, what, what these psychologists describe as the last stage of burnout, which is an actual collapse and requiring medical attention, but I think I stopped fairly close to that. So this is the email that I sent to the Django Core team. I haven't shared this before. Um, I feel a little weird talking through it, but it was, important, it was important for me to name what was going on, and I really just sort of ripped the Band-Aid off. I just said, I'm sorry, I know you're relying on me for things. I, I, was even, um, <laughs> I was even too exhausted to identify the things that I needed to hand off. I just knew that I, I just couldn't do it anymore, and I said, look, like, if there are things that I'm the only one who knows how to do, let me know and I'll try to make, make you know how to do them, but I, I, need, to, I need to step back. And, um, and luckily, I was surrounded by such a great group of people that everyone said, you know, please take care of yourself. What can I do to help? How can I, you know, and there was no, there was no, there was no shaming in it. All, all the sort of worries that I had about telling my, my, my friends and, and fellow contributors about it was, was totally unfounded. And I don't know why it took me so long. Okay, so I clearly got pretty burnt out. And, and I still am. I think I'm still recovering from it uh, around open source to some degree. Um, but you know, a year out now, I'm, I'm able to start thinking about why I got burnt out and what, what factors led to it. And so um, one of the things that really helped me there was, was Kathleen's talk, and these are a couple, three slides from, from her talk. Um, and she talked about a number of different things that can cause, that can lead to burnout. Um, balance, mismatching expectations, uh, pacing of work, and, and a feeling of a, a loss of control. And, and for me, it was really the, the first and the last ones, I think, that were the most, um, the, the biggest reasons. Balance was, was one. I, I was, you know, I was writing code full-time during the day and then going home and writing code full-time all night. I was, you know, basically only doing the one thing. I, you know, one was, one, the only difference between what I did during the day and what I did in the evenings was the license under which that code was written, which is pretty irrelevant to the work that you're actually doing. And so for me, this was really, you know, balance really translates to what, I, what I'm going to talk about in the next section is money, right? Like, I, I wasn't getting paid to do the work that I felt like I had to do, and I had to do the work that I was getting paid because, like, mortgages and bills and car payments and that sort of stuff. So I, I had to do, like, double work, one out of a feeling of obligation and one out of a feeling of, like, we live in a capitalist society and I need money. Um, and, but they were the same thing. And so I couldn't find that, that balance in my life. And then loss of control. So I, you know, I was supposedly a dictator, right? So why couldn't I do anything about toxic people in our community? I was, I'm supposed to be ruling by an iron fist, and so why can't I do anything about harassment and abuse? And that feeling of not having control over your own life and seeing no no way to sort of change the equation um, is really one of the sort of key contributing factors to burnout, or at least it was for me. What's really hard about this is I see this repeating in the Django community again. I see, I, I've seen the next cycle of really active contributors step up in the absence that Adrian and I left, burn themselves out, leave, and have been replaced again with yet another cycle. And we are, we're churning through people. We're, we're using our community like an exhaustible resource, burning them out and then going on to the next people who don't know that this is coming for them a couple years in. And I don't know what to do about that. I don't know how to prevent this. I don't know how to build a more sustainable, a more long-term community that doesn't just exhaust people and then cast them aside. So money. So there is a ton of money around open source. Um, the one that kind of annoys me personally is 
Facebook buys Instagram for a billion dollars, one billion dollars, and Instagram has not donated a cent or a line of code to Django or to Python, which they built those technology, that, that on top of. There is so much money around open source. There isn't a company out there that is not directly more profitable because they're using free software. And yet, very, very few people actually are getting paid for their work on open source. A shockingly small number of people. I was actually one of those lucky people. I got paid to work on open source. Um, in fact, I, I got paid a number of times to work on open source. Um, and, it, and it never really worked out. Um, when I was working at the newspaper and we originally released Django, um, the agreement was kind of, um, you know, part-time. Like, yeah, you can, you know, work on Django when it's, like, relevant because we're using it at work and don't when it's not. And, um, you know, ostensibly I, I was, you know, being sponsored by my employer still. But what happens with that sort of loosey-goosey arrangement is that over time, you know, work always seems more important, right? There's never, like, a good reason to, you know, to give, to give your work away, and especially when you're working on sort of this, in this sort of deadline-driven atmosphere that you are inside of a news organization, it's really hard to say, like, well, yeah, I know that we've got the big piece on um, government salaries coming out on Monday, but I, I really need to, like, you know, fix this bug report. Um, so when I got, had the opportunity, um, a company offered to pay me full time to work on Django until 1.0 was released just to get it out the door and then half time thereafter. It seemed like perfect, like that's exactly the right solution, like they're going to explicitly make working on open source my job. And for the first part of that worked really well, like was being paid 100% only working on open source, it was brilliant, it was like the dream that every open source developer has. That half time thing, I totally blew it. I straight up kept working full time on open source and I remember really clearly the, the phone call I got from my boss about, after about six months of that being like, dude, it's not working. <laughs> this, is not, this is not working out. And he was right. You know, he, he, he remains a, a really good friend um, uh, you know, despite having fired me. That's, that's a sign of a good manager when they can fire you and you still feel good about it. Um, but it was, you know, I couldn't make it work, right? Like, if, if half your job is doing something really exciting and fun and the other half is kind of trying to build a, a startup so it can get bought. <sighs> so then I founded a consultancy with the idea that, look, if I work for myself, it'll be super easy to set my own priorities. And that's a hilarious idea because, <laughs> because suddenly when you're the one paying the paychecks, open source never seems like a good idea. Um, and so I finally just kind of threw in the towel. You know, now, now, I, work for, now I work for Heroku. I'm a manager full time. I don't write code at work. We don't use Django or Python at work. I work in a different field. I work in security, not really in software development. Like, I just kind of gave up. My, I'm not being paid in any way to work, to work on open source. And in some ways, it actually feels healthier. So I couldn't make it work. And the fact is, this is not really that unique a story. Like, there are so few people who manage to make working on open source something that, that actually works out for them. Um, this is... a. Uh, uh, David McGiver, who, who work, works on a tool called Hypothesis, which is a really cool, um, anyway, it's kind of like a testing tool for, for Python code. We're sort of doing provably correct algorithms. It's really neat and um, being used super broadly. And he basically posted recently about just giving it up. He said, you know, I've done a reality check and I found reality wanting. I've been trying to figure out a way of making hypothesis development sustainable. And the answer is basically I can't, despite the fact it's clearly going to save people millions of dollars over the course of its lifetime. We've built an industry on free labor, and we've concluded that we'd much rather make people work for free in their spare time than fairly compensate for their labor and get good software. This is the same point that, um, that Ash Dryden made uh, maybe a year or so earlier, um, a blog post, uh, The Ethics of Unpaid Labor in the OSS Community. People contribute to open source freely um, and, mo and, and mostly enjoyably, right? I, I enjoyed it for, you know, eight or nine years of, of that 10-year arc. But we've somehow, Ash writes that we've been culturally talked into accepting this arrangement and, and not realizing that businesses are using it to extract value from us. The idea behind open source was to 
break free of proprietary software, to break free of this pay to play. And instead, she writes, we've ended up in a scenario where we are now paying for the development of software that large companies financially benefit from with little cost to them. We've somehow built this system where, yes, open source won in the sense that every company is an open source company now. I mean, Microsoft is open sourcing .NET. Like, how much more of a, of a, of a you know, of, of a, of a example do you need to show that sort of in the in the open source versus proprietary battle we won, but we won at such a cost. The cost now is that thousands of people are donating money to Microsoft and to Oracle and to Apple and to Google. That, like, that's weird. Would you write a check to Google? So why are you, why are you working on open source for them? It's very strange. So maybe this is getting better. I think there might be some signs that we're starting to get a little better about money in, in open source. Certainly in the Django community, we've seen several successful Kickstarter campaigns that have paid people to work on um, large, long-standing problems. Um, Django, for the first 10 years, didn't have any sort of built-in migrations framework, which was probably the biggest sort of usability problem um, that we had. And Andrew raised about twice what he asked for to build, uh, build a migrations framework for Django, and it's great, and it solved a big problem, and he got paid, and you know, everyone's happy. So you know, that's good. I worry that these are proprietary platforms and that we're sort of hitching our, you know, we're, we're hitching our hopes and dreams to someone else's profit sharing or, or profit center again. We have a fully funded Django fellowship now. We pay one person full time to work on Django. Um, this is a little bit weird, like it was easy to fund the first year. I wonder what's going to happen when we go back to that well the next year. And it's also strange because of the laws around nonprofits in, in the US. What, what we're allowed to employ someone to do is complicated and we have to be somewhat careful about how we, how we structure that work. Um, maybe the answer is better corporate citizenship. Um, there are other funding models. I have some, some links here, you can, you can read about them. So, so maybe, maybe we're starting to figure it out. But on the other hand, venture capital is also investing in open source. <laughs> and because clearly the way to make open source less exploitative is to get venture capital involved. <laughs> I don't know, maybe we need something more radical. Like maybe this is not a technology problem, maybe we need basic income. Maybe that's how we solve this problem. <laughs> maybe, we need, maybe we need a strike. Can you imagine if everyone who worked on open source said, fuck you, pay me? <laughs> so I couldn't, make it, I couldn't make it work financially, but for me, the thing that really sapped the remaining amount of my will um, was, was, were the toxic people in, in our community. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous talking about this. This is a tough, tough story to tell. So Jeremy Dunk was a friend of mine. I considered him a friend for almost 10 years. And when I found out that he had been systematically um, creeping on and harassing women in the community for many years, it was a, it was a gut punch. Um, he was banned from, from Double Union, which is a, a feminist hacker space in San Francisco, the only person to have, to have been banned. I found out about it slightly before this, this blog post was published when um, a friend reached out to tell me what was going on. Um, and this is difficult to talk about because um, I really can only talk about what's, what's been published publicly because to do so otherwise would um, betray confidences and I'm not going to do that. Um, and this is really common when you're dealing with toxic people. They take advantage of a power imbalance to ensure that the people that they are, to ensure that the people that they are harassing are going to be less likely to be able to speak out about it. And my, my, my willingness to participate in a space with someone like this is basically zero, but I also have been unable to entirely kick him out. And this also is common because we rely on this idea of having enough evidence that someone is actually a, a harasser. 
So these are some of the reactions that people had to that blog post. I, I'm not citing a source here. I, I'm usually try to be fairly careful about citing sources because I, I really don't want to be sort of shaming the people who said this. That several of these quotes are from people who I who I respect highly, um, and I think that they're coming from a good place. My point here is to show how how our sort of patriarchal expectations reinforce a, a, a place where we allow toxic people to stay. The, these people are coming from a good place, but they're reacting to an accusation of harassment in, in, a, in a somewhat unfortunately predictable way. You know, I didn't find these emails creepy, but he's a fantastic ally. Why are we publicly shaming someone? I don't know what happened. It didn't seem cre creepy. Jeremy is a good person. I haven't seen enough evidence. And these are, these are really common responses. Um, to understand this, I turned to uh, uh, a collection of essays that I found really fantastic. Um, Revolution Starts at Home, Confronting Intimate Violence Within Activist Communities. Now, it's specifically about um, partner violence in, in activist communities. But it provides, there, there, and there's a lot of, um, this is a collection of essays, and they are all um, somewhat tough and also really amazing to read. Um, but it provides more, it, it speaks to more than just sort of partner violence and, and activist communities. It really talks quite a bit about how and why um, abusers are allowed to stay within our communities, even when they are explicitly set up to combat those types of, of abuse. Um, so there's a section at the end called Community Accountability Within People of Color Progressive Mo Movements, which is just an amazing resource to understand that what goes on when we're refusing to see abuse in our communities. Um, and the authors write, patriarchy upholds and supports gender oppression. And they identify four ways in which this works. Denial, minimizing, victim blaming, and counter organizing. And so I want to go through those and then we'll look back at those quotes and you can kind of see how this functions. So denial looks like um, characterizing issues as personal or private, writing off sexual harassments as, as misunderstandings or, or flirting or, oh, he just likes you. Um, brief aside, the, the authors of Revolution Starts at Home always use the pronoun he to identify abusers because abusers are predominantly male, but they acknowledge, and I want to also, that that's not always true. That's simply the predominant gender in, in abusive relationships. Minimizing looks like, again, calling something a misunderstanding, saying that it's taking away from the real or the important work, but this person is such a good ally, but this person is such a good activist, their work is important, or deliberately addressing issues in a very ineffectual and non-toothy um, non way. Think of the conference that um, I think it was Reader Khan that reacted to an abuser in their, in their community by banning him for two years. That's addressing the problem, but what makes you believe that after two years he's not going to repeat the same behavior? Victim blaming, among the other ways it works, is by characterizing the abusers as victims. They're nice, they're heroes, they're important to our work. Why are we publicly shaming? And counter-organizing looks like deliberate reaction to, um, to accusations, threatening to fire people, um, as happened in this case, discrediting the person who raised the concern rather than dealing with the substance of it, questionizing the legitimacy of the concern, questionizing the need for accountability in the first place. So I did not find these emails offensive is denial and minimizing. I have always found him to be an ally. This reeks of public shaming, victim blaming, counter organizing, denial, minimizing, victim blaming, victim blaming, denial, counter organizing. And again, these are people I, I respect and, and, think, and think highly of and, and think genuinely want to deal with these problems. These are not, you know, these are not anonymous trolls. These are not, you know, anti-feminists. These are people who are trying very hard to grapple with these issues and are still falling into this trap that our culture lays for us. And the problem is most abusive men don't seem abusive except to their victims. 
And that observation comes from Lundy Bancroft's uh, Why Does He Do That? Um, the best thing that I've read into un that really helps understand the psychology of men who harass and abuse and why, and why they do that. I knew Jeremy for 10 years, and I didn't have a clue. The problem is that we approach abuse in kind of this legalistic frame. You know, we need, uh, we need a conviction beyond a shadow of a doubt or, you know, preponderance of evidence. And this is a mistake. We're not a court. We're not a justice system. We don't need to have proof that someone is, is, is an abuser. I mean, let's, let's take a thought experiment, right? Let's say, let's say there's someone in your community like this and you have a, you, and you have a suspicion that they're behaving in some, in some crappy way. So you've, you've got two options. You, just can, you can kick them out without much evidence. And so what's the ramifications if you do that? Well, they can no longer be part of your community. Maybe it makes it a little, little harder for them to get a job. Probably not, especially if they're a white guy because we benefit from assumed competence. But OK, maybe it's a little bit harder because they can't claim to be part of your community anymore. They don't get to come to community events. Is that really a big problem? I don't think it's huge. So let's flip it around. Let's say you let them stay and the accus accusations are true. Well, how many people are they, going to, are, are they going to exclude from your community because they feel harassed and abused? One, two, 10, 50? The harm of letting someone stay is so much greater than the harm of kicking them out, even if you're wrong. And yet we still approach these things from this idea of needing evidence. And even as BDFL, I did not have evidence. I still don't have evidence to really be claiming if I, if I need to prove in a court of law before I can get this, before I can expel this person. The problem is that being fair and balanced benefits the abusers. Bancroft writes that it's not possible to be truly balanced in one's view of an abuser and an abused woman. Neutrality actually serves the interests of the perpetrator much more than those of the victim. It is not neutral. In reality, to remain neutral is to collude with the abusive man, whether or not that is your goal. We live in an unbalanced society, so neutrality is unbalanced. So the worst part about this, the thing that's really difficult, is this was not the first time. This was not the first time that someone I knew and considered a friend, I later found out to be a toxic person. It wasn't even the second time. This has become common. This has become a thing that happens. Um, somebody tweeted, I went looking for it, I couldn't find it, so if you know who to, who to cite here, please tell me, that if you're a man and a woman hasn't told you about an experience of harassment, it's because nobody trusts you enough. It's not because you don't know women who've been harassed. And this wasn't the last time. There's a person right now in the central to the Python community who I even once considered a mentor who is acting in some pretty shitty ways. And I have an opportunity right now to name a name, and, I'm, and I don't think I can. I'm not going to. Because the harm that it would do to the people who can't come forward is greater than the benefit that I would, that I would gain by calling this person out. We've built systems that don't force accountability on people who behave in this way. And I don't know how to change that equation. We have codes of conduct and they're a start. They at least tell us where the boundaries are. But they're not enough if we can't actually do something about people who cross those boundaries, if we can't change the legalistic frame that we, that we view these, these problems from. We have to figure out a way to remove toxic people from our communities. Because if we don't, non-toxic people will leave. And that's what I did, I left. And I've stopped trying to get new people in because I don't know how I can, in good conscience, say you should come be a part of our community when I know that we don't have the tools to deal with the creepers. So I had three problems that I couldn't solve and I still can't solve. And I still don't know how to fix these problems. The reason that I wanted to give this talk in particular to this group is I think it, it, if anybody has an idea 
how to solve them. Maybe it's, maybe it's some of you. Thank you.